All right, uh, so this is a webinar, which means that you won't be able to use your microphone. Um, if you have any questions, please use the uh, chat box and uh, I'll answer them at the end. Um, thanks everyone for attending this Lunch and Learn focused on the History Center's collect collecting efforts surrounding the pandemic. Um, it's mainly gonna be focused on items we've collected, uh, kind of work we're doing around the pandemic with a little bit at the beginning about the beginning of the pandemic since it's been over a year since it uh, started affecting Central Florida. So on March 1st, uh, Florida announced its first two cases of COVID-19, making it the 10th state to do so. By March 11th, the WHO declared COVID-19 a pandemic. By the 15th, we started collecting uh, material related to the pandemic. By the 18th, the History Center had closed its doors to the public. And on April 1st, the governor issued a statewide stay at home order due to the pandemic. So this type of collecting is called contemporary collecting. Uh, essentially, it means that it's collecting material in real time as it happens. Um, this, this is a type of collecting we've been doing at the History Center for a while now. Uh, biggest, the biggest example would be Pulse nightclub shooting um, and a couple of hurricanes following that. But essentially it means collecting right after something happens when it's still fresh, when information is still uh, available. Um, so that, that's one of the advantages to it. Uh, it means that uh, people still have access, people haven't had a chance to throw away things or forget things. Um, it's still fresh in their minds. The downside is that people don't tend to think of, you know, something that happened earlier that day or the day before as being history. They think of history as being something that happened years ago, which means they don't think of the history center or museums uh, as an option for what they have. Uh, the other challenge is with contemporary collect collecting, you don't know what's going to be valuable in the future. So you kind of have to make an educated guess at what will be valuable going forward. Um, and this is, you know, something we collected, something I collected a few days ago. Uh, the Department of uh, Economic Opportunity Unemployment uh, for Florida. Uh, and this is, this just tracks kind of how how they're dealing with COVID turning out for unemployment. So with the pandemic, the question was what to collect. Um, we knew right away, I mean, we knew the general idea, you know, we're gonna want photos, we're gonna want videos, we're gonna want oral histories, we're gonna want physical items. But, you know, during the pandemic, what does that actually mean? You know, what is a photo of the pandemic? What's an, what's an interview related to the pandemic? What's a physical item representative of the pandemic? Some of those things were pretty easy to uh, figure out quickly. Um, you know, right away we knew we wanted PPE uh, and medical equipment like ventilators and masks. Um, they were a huge part of the pandemic and huge demand at the beginning of the pandemic and still are. Um, so we knew we wanted that, but at the same time, we also knew that we weren't going to collect it anytime soon. And in most cases, probably wouldn't start collecting that until after the pandemic had ended because we didn't want to take away from places that actively needed to use it. Um, you know, there was a big shortage of PPE and ventilators. Um, and so we wanted to make sure we didn't take any of those or, or bother the people who were using those items. Uh, so along those same lines with oral histories, uh, we knew we wanted to interview doctors, nurses, medical workers, uh, frontline workers, people directly affected by the pandemic. But at the same time, um, we didn't want to bother them while they were doing the important work they were doing. Uh, and we also, you know, with the oral history, it makes sense to wait longer so you get the full story, not just coverage of a week or two, especially considering how long the pandemic has last, lasted so far. So our first steps uh, were on the 17th of March, 2020, we sent out an internal uh, 
a donation call to a staff asking for uh, specific, some, a couple of specific things related to the pandemic and then just kind of a general uh, pandemic related items. We followed that up on March 20th with an article in the Orlando Sentinel uh, asking for, a, for items from the general public. We got pretty good success off of that. Um, we also created the History Center's COVID-19 collecting uh, form, which is what's pictured on this slide. And that is a form we put up on our website where if you have something you, you're interested in donating, you can go there, uh, fill out a little information and add that item. Um, there, it also has my contact information on there as well. Um, and we've, we've had some pretty great success with that form. Uh, and that's also still available on our website. Um, so the first things we asked for, without really knowing what we wanted, just kind of having a general idea and kind of looking at the first few days of what was happening in Central Florida as a result of the pandemic. We asked for um, correspondence from local businesses about what was going on, uh, photos that represented the pandemic, um, and connections for future oral histories. So the first donation we received kind of ended up in our laps by chance, and they consisted of emails sent out by local businesses um, describing how the pandemic was changing what they were doing. Uh, so at the very beginning, that was increased uh, cleaning protocols, uh, changes to store hours, you know, instituting senior hours, or reducing store hours so that uh, more cleaning could be done outside of open hours. Uh, then it progressed into uh, closures when, when the um, stay-at-home order took effect and you know, later on, possibly when businesses had to shut down permanently. Uh, so we got, we got a number of those internally from staff and we also got some from outside don donors thanks to our uh, public call out. Pretty much right, right around the same time as we got those, we also started getting photos uh, of empty shelves in grocery stores. And, um, you know, it was, it was at the beginning of the pandemic, it was a very clear, very easy to notice uh, effect that the pandemic was having. Um, you know, you'd go to the store to get toilet paper and the entire aisle was empty, not just toilet paper, but all the paper products. Or you'd go and you'd try to get pasta and, and it's all gone. Um, so that was something that pretty much everyone in the area was able to see very easily and very readily. That was a clear effect of the pandemic. So we got a number of photos uh, from stores all around Central Florida, both from staff and from outside donors related to that. Um, and then later on, we also got photos of, you know, how social distancing was used in stores, uh, you know, signs on the floor saying one with directions, uh, people uh, waiting six feet apart in line to check out, um, things like that. So around the same time, we also started getting photos of uh, signs on closed businesses. Um, and these were mostly from businesses that were, you know, one location, kind of uh, not, not chains, not uh, big corporations. These were um, local, local, organ local businesses. And so a lot of the signs were handmade or, or you know, created by the business owner. And that led to a lot of uh, differences and, and changes in how the wording was and the day that, you know, the closes act, closures actually took place. Um, and so we collected, we collected uh, quite a few of these, again, both from staff and from outside donations. Um, and these, these are interesting because they kind of... Uh, show how different people looked at the pandemic at different times and you know when they actually chose to close their businesses. Um, so one area of our collection that I'm not really going to focus on too much during this presentation is our collecting of kind of the data behind the pandemic. So the actual numbers of people infected, um, the distribution of you know, where people were infected, where, where, you know, numbers of infected people were, um, 
kind of how the pandemic progressed in the actual hard data associated with it. And this includes, you know, uh, trackers, um, documents sent out by the state uh, listing new case numbers, uh, vaccination numbers, um, articles, uh, news articles related to the pandemic. Um, so that's all stuff that we did collect uh, and we are still collecting. It just doesn't make for a good presentation. Um, it is something that I think will be much more valuable uh, for future researchers that didn't necessarily live through the pandemic, um, since it has kind of a day, day by day progression of how the pandemic changed and what was happening every single day. Uh, so the photo here was taken on March 20th, 2020, and it's from the official, uh, Florida's official COVID-19 data and surveillance dashboard. Um, so you can see that total case numbers was at 563. Uh, April 1st, cases went up to 6,000. And these are from yesterday, April 1st, 2021. Um, over 2 million cases. And the second tracker here that I decided to include was created by uh, Rebecca Jones, who was also in instrumental in creating the official Florida tracker. And I included it because uh, at this point, a lot of, there's a good number of people who consider it to be more accurate and a more valuable data source than the official uh, COVID-19 dashboard. Um, so before the uh, pandemic even reached Florida's shores, it was affecting countries all over the world. Um, kind of one of the first industries hit really hard by the pandemic was the cruise, cruise ship cruise line industry. Um, you know, it's, it's a place where a whole lot of people are uh, stuck in close, close quarters. Um, they make trips to uh, ports of call in different countries where they interact with the, with the public and then all go back onto the ship and are stuck together. Uh, so outbreaks on cruise ships was a big, big part of the early days of the pandemic and, and you know, thought to be one of the ways that it spread. Uh, so we were fortunate enough to connect and find uh, a a few people who were passengers on cruise ships and someone who was a uh, crew member on a cruise ship that uh, had to deal with COVID-19 outbreaks. So all of the photos here are from a couple of passengers that got stuck on a, a, Disney, a, a Dis Disney princess cruise ship that was sailing around Japan and a few other countries at the end of January, 2020 and early February. Uh, so they ended up having some COVID cases pop up on, on board and they had to quarantine in Japan uh, and they got stuck there for a while. And then they ended up getting flown um, in kind of a, a special plane or you know, not a commercial plane to uh, Travis Air Force Base where they were again quarantined and weren't allowed to leave until they had two negative COVID tests in a row. Um, and so we were fortunate enough to collect uh, oral histories, documents, videos, and photos from, from these uh, Florida residents' experiences during the, this very difficult time. Um, and it's, it's a really interesting story and kind of shows, you know, how big of an impact it had on some people's lives at the beginning and still does. So during last year that we've been dealing with the pandemic, there's kind of a lot of uh, uh, events that took place that might not directly relate to the pandemic, but still had, uh, but the pandemic still had a significant impact on how those events were treated and how we handled them. Uh, for example, in uh, June of last, of 2020, there was a tornado that hit Orlando and you know, usually that would have been a huge news item. Uh, there would have been a lot of uh, media attention and um, kind of reaction to it. But because of all the COVID news that was going on at the time, 
the story was really only a blip on the radar. It lasted a day, maybe two, and then kind of disappeared from focus. Um, but COVID, COVID uh, safety protocols also affected the cleanup efforts, but made it harder for uh, the community to help out. And it made it so that um, cleanup efforts ended up taking longer than they normally would have. So during uh, last year, during the uh, pandemic, um, Fringe was going through its 29th annual Orlando Fringe Festival. And because of safety concerns, they decided to transform the event from a physical uh, in-person event to a virtual event. Um, because of that, we were able to uh, preserve recordings of almost the entire uh, festival and add those to our collection. We were also able to collect uh, some physical items that would have been distributed to uh, the guests and attendees, like the items that are pictured here. And we also got uh, quite a few oral histories with people involved in Fringe. Um, and that was focused both on how the pandemic affected that year's event, and also kind of detailing the history of Fringe for the last 29 years, which is a really uh, in great get for the History Center. Um, so one of the biggest events that took place last year uh, during the pandemic was the Black Lives Matter protests. You know, these took place uh, across the country. Um, Central Florida had a direct connection with it in, in some sense because one of the officers involved in the uh, tragedy um, owned property in the area and there were protests held outside of, outside of that property along with you know, places all around Central Florida. So this is, this is one of the areas that we really focused on collecting from, um, both because of it, its you know, own importance and because of its connection and kind of you know, looking at it from within, uh, within COVID and the pandemic. Um, so both those areas, but you know, it's something we collected uh, lots and lots of photos from, some videos, oral histories with some of the speakers and organizers and attendees. Um, we weren't able to collect any uh, actual signs or actual physical items from it uh, because of COVID concerns. But you know, this is something we are still actively pursuing uh, items from, and we are still collecting from the, the protests and you know, trying to make sure we document that as fully as possible because of how important of an event it was and is. Uh, so lots of businesses closed during the pandemic. Um, Central Florida, kind of have to talk about the theme parks. Um, all the theme parks ended up closing uh, due to safety concerns, obviously. Um, out of that, uh, one thing we were able to capture, uh, Disney allowed a photographer named Alex Menendez uh, the chance to fly over Disney and take photos of the park during the day while it was empty. Um, and so this, this is something that is, you know, incredibly rare and unique. Um, the airspace over Disney is usually restricted, which means nobody's allowed to fly there. And so uh, him having the ability to do that, you know, is unique on its own. But also when you add in the fact that it's the middle of the day, and Disney is completely empty, you know, something else that you never really see. Um, so we were able to uh, grab a few of those photos from him um, and add those to our collection as well. Um, once the theme parks reopened, we got quite a few photos and videos from people who were attending either, you know, the first day that theme parks opened or uh, the first few days and weeks that they opened. Um, so we got photos of you know, people walking through, people experiencing rides. We also got videos of people's experiences during their trip. So you know, in some cases, we got their whole day's trip to a park um, as a video, as a, in some cases, sped up video, but video of their whole experience, you know, seeing the improved safety protocols, seeing uh, kind of how everything had changed 
uh, to accommodate or to protect people during the pandemic. Um, and so we were able to document that pretty well. So there's one theme that you'll kind of see throughout this, uh, throughout kind of the photos that are being shown during this presentation. It's places that don't have people, uh, places that usually would be absolutely packed with people and there aren't any. Um, this, this ended up being kind of a big representation of the pandemic here. It's, you know, places that should be crowded with people where no one is. Um, theme parks, hotels, a lot of hotels in the area had to shut down. The ones that stayed open had, you know, an incredibly lowered amount of guests than they usually would. Uh, these photos are from the Gaylord Palms Resort and the Orlando Hilton, uh, which were open to guests, but I mean, you can see there's almost no one there um, besides the person taking the photo who was a guest. Uh, but, you know, absence of people was kind of a representation of the pandemic. Restaurants, another heavily affected industry uh, due to the pandemic. Um, lots of restaurants had to close at least temporary, temporarily. Some of them had to close permanently. Um, there were a lot of changes that had to be installed. Uh, you know, no indoor dining um, had to change to uh, curbs, curbside pickup, delivery, um, kind of change their entire, in some cases, change their entire business models to fit with the pandemic. Um, and so we, we've collected some photos of, you know, how, how, how that's changed, uh, you know, outside, outside signs that they put up. Um, we have a few photos from inside restaurants, but not very many. Um, we are still looking to collect oral histories from a couple uh, food service restaurant workers, um, kind of detailing our experience over the pandemic, but that's not something we've uh, been able to find yet um, or pursued too heavily just due to, again, we don't want to interrupt all the extra works that, they, that these people have been doing um, with an interview with us until kind of COVID has passed. Schools affected, uh, you know, affected parents, teachers, students, all in unique and different ways, um, but a huge effect all across the state. Um, so we kind, of, we kind of collected this in two different areas. Uh, the first being teachers. Um, so during the pandemic, teachers, teacher organizations, teacher unions had to fight and work really hard to ensure that the state um, kept students and teachers uh, safe for in-person learning um, and you know fighting for when in-person learning should resume, how virtual learning should work, and um, just fighting as hard as they could to keep people safe. So we were able to collect um, some photos, uh, a number of um, signs that were used during protests, teachers, protests and marches that uh, teachers held to uh, make sure their students were safe. Um, and we also collected oral histories from a number of different teachers that were involved in kind of the union side of, uh, of these discussions, uh, teachers that were in the classroom and some teachers that ended up um, resigning or retiring due to safety concerns um, with the pandemic. On the other side, we collected uh, material related to students. Um, so all of these pictures here, we have the actual um, letters that were written. Uh, so we have a kind of a, a little stack of letters that were, or letters, notes that were written by young children about their experience during the pandemic. Um, kind of just how the pandemic was uh, directly affecting them. So this is really interesting because it's uh, you know, a perspective that we don't have a lot of. Um, young children kind of straight out saying what, how the pandemic was affecting them personally, um, which gives us a nice window into what their life was like, like during this time. Uh, we were also able to collect a uh, virtual diary, virtual videos of a student who was dealing with a mild case of COVID-19 
know, kind of, uh, you know, taking a daily look at what that meant for her and for her family. Um, we also worked with a university professor uh, who, as a class assignment, had their students conduct oral histories with someone in their life uh, about COVID-19. And then as, you know, they sent it back, got graded, and then the history center got those results, got, got those oral histories. We also helped, you know, set up and kind of uh, teach them how to conduct those as well. Um, and that's something that we are working on, possibly making that something that happens again for the next, this next sem upcoming semester as well, for the, for the next class. Um, like a lot of the businesses I mentioned, the History Center was also affected by the pandemic pretty strongly. Um, on March 18th, when we had to close our doors to the public, it meant that all of our income, all of our revenue from ticket sales disappeared instantly. Um, all of the events that we had booked going forward past that date canceled and had to be refunded, which meant we lost out on a lot of our income. Uh, fortunately, we were able to secure PPP funding along with uh, working to get additional grant funding. And we got increased donations from uh, the public that was able to help us kind of get through the pandemic. On the other side of that, uh, when the pandemic started, we were about to um, put out an exhibit, or we were working to put out an exhibit on uh, Pulse Year 4 Remembrance, um, which was intended to be a physical exhibit in person and had to quickly be transformed into a virtual exhibit. That exhibit is still available on our website if anyone wasn't able to uh, check it out already. Um, like a lot of people, uh, we didn't really expect the pandemic to last as long as it continues to last. And so we ended up having a second exhibit come up that we had to go through a similar process. And that was, that's still open, but yesterday this was home, the Akoi Massacre of 1920. Um, and so we had to look at that and kind of decide, you know, was it going to be virtual as well? Could we safely make it an in-person exhibit? Um, you know, what, what, what would fit better with that exhibit? And we ended up deciding um, to keep it as a, as a in-person exhibit, which meant we implemented a whole lot more safety protocols, uh, time ticket entry, limited access. Um, and, you know, even building the exhibit, we had to be really careful about how staff interacted each, with each other and uh, tried to maintain as much safety as possible. Um, during that process. And if anyone hasn't seen it yet, it is still open. It closes on April 4th. So visit it soon. It's a great exhibit. Um, and on March 26th, early uh, of 2020, we, the History Center also donated its supply of gloves to Orlando Health to help, to help with their shortages during the uh, beginning of the pandemic for, with medical supplies. So again, empty, empty photos of empty places, in this case, streets. Um, at the beginning of the pandemic, and especially when the stay-at-home order took effect, uh, streets that normally would have been jam-packed with cars were completely empty. Um, you know, some of these photos came from downtown Orlando at about seven o'clock in the morning during the week. It should have been rush hour, should have been packed with cars, and there's no one there. Um, again, you know, that's kind of a representation of the pandemic, absence of people. Uh, kind of a direct, a direct effect on, or kind of a direct feel, something that people felt in their lives, um, haircuts, you know, the decision of, are you going to try to cut it yourself? Are you going to let it grow out? Are you going to risk going and getting it professionally cut? Um, and, you know, what, what did that, how does that decision affect you? Um, so we collected a few photos related to different methods of trying to keep people safe while getting a haircut. We also got an oral history with a, a, a hair professional. Um, so one of the areas of our collection that is less developed 
and I would like is um, our coverage of COVID-19 testing sites and starting now uh, vaccination sites. Um, you know, it's, it, they played a huge role in the pandemic and how we responded, how we, you know, pretty much the whole process of the pandemic, they were there, they were active, um, but we don't, this is one of the few photos we have of a testing site. Um, and we would really like to get more photos, more videos and oral histories with uh, participants or with uh, staff that were working there um, because it is such an important part of the pandemic. Same thing goes for vaccination sites. So we can put out a call for donation for things that we, you know, we know are happening, we know we're going to be interested in, but there's a lot of things that, you know, we don't know about, we haven't heard about, or they're not on a smaller scale, they haven't been reported, they're not in our direct connection of people we know. Um, we're, we're still interested in those type of things, but we just don't have access to them, or we don't know they exist, so we can't ask for them. Uh, as an example, this, these are photos from the South Branch Central Florida YMCA food distribution effort. Um, and again, uh, food insecurity was a, has been a huge issue during the pandemic with lots of people who've been uh, lost their jobs during the pandemic or been furloughed and you know still have to be able to feed themselves but haven't been able to. Um, I mean, you can see how long the line of cars is waiting to get into, get, waiting to get food. Um, so we, we never would have seen these photos. We never would have known about it if it weren't for uh, a donor reaching out to us and saying, hey, you know, I was here. I took these photos. I, you know, I was involved. This is something that should be preserved and sending it to us. We were able to preserve it. Masks, I mean, you can't really talk about the pandemic without looking at masks. Um, big part of it, uh, we have a whole bunch of photos of people wearing masks, of different types of masks. Um, we intend to have a number of photo, uh, a number of actual masks added to the collection, but again, that's gonna wait until uh, they're no longer needed by people. Um, and they can, they, they're, you know, treated as history versus treated as uh, something you have to wear every day. Um, kind of along the same lines, we are, we have photos of people making masks. Uh, homemade mask making uh, kind of exploded and became a really important thing during the pandemic. Um, so we have photos of people making masks. We've also uh, contacted and talked to a couple local mask making um, organizations and when the pandemic ends, we're hopefully gonna get some, some of their handmade local masks to add to our collection. Social distancing, um, something you see pretty much everywhere you go, uh, something that happened all across the country, um, but it was also a way that we could make it locally um, our own. Uh, so you can see that City of Orlando used swans in a couple different ways to illustrate the six feet of social distance um, for a more Florida in general, uh, using alligators. And uh, we even have a photo of, from a veteran vet uh, office where they use dogs as, as uh, distancing. Um, so it was just it, you know very visual part of the pandemic, um, something that everyone who lived through it will no doubt completely remember, but in the future might just kind of fade away and be forgotten. But now we have at least a little bit collected from it. So one of our big pushes uh, in collecting was looking at communities. Um, this, is, this is kind of the, uh, the, the challenging area for us because again, if we're not within that community, if we're not living in that neighborhood, we probably don't know that something has happened. We don't know what they did unless someone from there uh, tells us. So, you know, you've got uh, in the first photo here, happy birthday, uh, a sign on someone's front lawn. That could have been because there was a uh, car caravan that was in response to someone's birthday because um, they couldn't have an actual party, you know. Um, 
signs put up in support of healthcare workers and medical workers during the pandemic. And even, even uh, kind of small uh, projects like the TP project where you could um, buy toilet paper and donate it to someone and have, you know, have it set up on someone's, someone you know's front lawn and essentially donate toilet paper to them, which was a thing when um, that the shortages were happening early on in the pandemic. Um, so another kind of, kind of community, a big community push was the Mask Up project. Uh, this was uh, organized and heavily supported by Onyx Magazine. Um, they worked really hard and are still working hard to make sure um, underserved communities and people who didn't have access to masks were able to get them uh, for free or, or at much lower cost. Um, and now they're also working really hard on making sure people get vaccinated in underserved communities. Um, when we announced that this uh, uh, presentation was going to happen, um, someone from Onyx Magazine reached out to us and, and you know, was really interested in donating and, and, and sharing kind of all the work that they had done. Um, and uh, so we are working with them right now to include oral histories, documents, even the commercial they made. Uh, in support of masking up and, and encouraging people to wear a mask. Um, so we're, we're, that is an in-progress donation. We're working with them right now to uh, add that to the collection and kind of enhance what we already have about the local areas. Um, art. Uh, art was, in some cases, severely limited with what could actually be done stuck at home. Um, so we got, we got some artistic work created by people who were stuck in their homes, couldn't really go out, uh, had to take advantage of what was available and what represented the pandemic. So, you know, you can see toilet paper, masks, um, sitting at home alone, looking at, staring out the window. Um, so we got a number of donations from uh, the public about that. We were also fortunate enough to collect a podcast called Unwinding Chronicles of COVID-19 focused on the wine industry and uh, how the pandemic was affecting it in you know, Central Florida. Another big part of the art, art scene uh, was chalk art, community art, sidewalk art. Um, this was mainly directed towards the increasing foot, tra tra foot traffic in people's neighborhoods uh, with a lot more people teleworking a lot more people uh, virtual uh, learning from home, doing uh, virtual school learning from home, a lot more people stuck at home in general. Um, it kind of led to an explosion of people walking, going out for walks in their neighborhood um, as a family or on their own. And uh, again, people in those neighborhoods decided, you know, they put out something visible for, the, for other people in their community to see. Um, something that was really intended just for that area um, to make their walks more interesting and kind of alleviate some of the pressure that came with the pandemic. Um, one, one project in particular was the Great Gnome Project. Um, and this, this happened around, the lake, uh, around Lake Cuomo. Um, and it consisted of a, an artist who painted um, a bunch of, uh, gnomes and hung them up kind of around around their neighborhood uh, near walking trails so that families that were walking around could uh, see them interact with them try to you know turn it into a kind of a game of trying to find them and then uh, when they got home they could go back they could go to a facebook group connected with it look up the uh, gnomes and kind of read a story about them an individual story for each gnome um, so we, we have some photos of, of these gnomes. And we're also working to uh, collect some of the actual paintings themselves and add those to the collection, along with the stories associated with the gnomes. Um, in the chalk art scene, or you know, in that medium of art, one artist named Casey Drake did some really amazing work locally. Uh, I, I included a few of hers in some of the previous slides, a, a few of the pieces in some of the 
previous slide, but she did, she's made a lot of uh, COVID pandemic related, um, very topical uh, art pieces. Um, and we were fortunate enough to collect photos from quite a few of these. Uh, the photo in the middle, um, Tiger King, Carol Vaskin, that one actually ended up going viral uh, right, right around the same time that Tiger King went out and put, you know, put Orlando on the map um, in one sense. Um, so, you know, tourism, transportation, big part of uh, Orlando. Um, MCO airport usually jam-packed with people. Uh, at the beginning of the pandemic, um, one of the areas that we weren't able to document because of safety concerns was uh, when all the flights were getting canceled and uh, halted, MCO's uh, runways were uh, filled with planes, um, just kind of lined up next to each other on runways, um, which you know is, is something that doesn't happen ordinarily. It's something we really wanted to capture photo photos of, but due to safety concerns and kind of not knowing what, what the pandemic meant at that time, uh, we weren't able to get those, but it's something we're still looking for. Uh, the photos here were actually photos I took um, a little bit later into the pandemic when I had to travel, um, but you know it was still almost completely empty. I, I was able to get through security without standing in line at all. I just you know, walked up and was able to walk right through security. Um, all the shops, or almost all the shops, almost all the restaurants on the other side were shut down. The airplanes were filled to, you know, only half full. Um, and just, you know, something I have never experienced in my life, uh, uh, just how empty it was. Um, and I, you know, I don't think most people have ever been to a major airport like this in the middle of the day and seen it as empty as it was. Um, so there's a few things that we are still looking for. Um, I kind of highlighted the things that we are really interested in documenting that either we don't have very much about or is something that we think is really important to document that we haven't been able to document as fully as we want. Um, so there's a list of kind of events, um, things that we're interested in, and a list of oral history topics that we're also interested in collecting. Um, again, you know, this is, th these are kind of the events we know about. There's definitely other events that happened, other things that we should be preserving that we don't know about that, you know, if, if you know of such an event, if you attended one, if you have material related to one and you're interested in donating, um, you can use the COVID-19 donation form on our website. You can also email me about it. My, my contact info is on that donation sheet. Um, so, you know, if you know someone, let us know. We'd love to talk to them. We'd love to add to our collection.